Dominating the news today, after a brief interruption, Ukraine peace talks have continued in Minsk. That's as the leaders of Russia, Germany, France and Ukraine return to the marathon negotiations, which are now heading into their 17th hour. Barack Obama asks the U.S. Congress to authorize the limited use of ground troops against Islamic State, his first such request in six years of his presidency. And Swedish security guards have been accused of overstepping the mark after assaulting a nine-year-old boy without a train ticket. Your worldwide news live from Moscow. This is RT International. From me, Rory Suchet, and the entire news team, welcome to the program. Straight to our breaking news story for you this hour. The peace talks in Ukraine are still ongoing. The leaders of Russia, Germany, France and Ukraine now locked in discussions for over 16 hours. While no official statements on progress have been given so far, throughout the course of these marathon negotiations, officials have been stepping out to comment on the overall mood inside the hall. And their assessments have certainly been quite varied. Uh, fairly early into the process, the Russian foreign minister proclaimed the talks were going, quote, better than super. However, later on, Ukraine's president expressed a markedly different opinion, saying that there was no good news so far. He added that Russia has been putting forward unacceptable conditions. For more on the ongoing talks and the mixed messages emerging from them, let's cross live now to RT's Daniel Bushel, still there in Minsk. Daniel, uh, we understand now the talks approximately entering the 17th hour. Some calling that a good sign, some calling it a bad sign. Your assessment? Yes, negotiations weren't easy, that's for sure. From the outset, Ukraine's Petro Poroshenko was booed by some journalists who asked him about violence in the east of the country. Talks were behind closed doors and no one except the leaders of Ukraine, Germany, Russia and France knew actually what was happening. At one point, Ukraine's leader also left the room briefly and, according to Ukrainian media, went to consult his military commanders. The German foreign minister postponed a scheduled trip to Brazil and stayed in Minsk after also calling the talks, quote, uneasy. Leaders also broke for a late-night dinner before getting back to the negotiations. Some journalists saw through the open doors how the leaders of Ukraine and Russia were engaged in emotional discussion. All right, Artis, uh, Daniel Bush are there live in Minsk outside the uh, Independence Palace. Thank you very much for that. Let's uh, show you now exactly where all the waiting has been taking place. Indeed, some journalists uh, seem to have settled in for the night. You can hardly blame them. We're now hearing that uh, one woman even had to be taken to hospital. Now, very little is known about the exact details of the Minsk talks, but some things have emerged. The French president said last week that Ukraine's eastern regions need a, quote, quite strong autonomy from the government in Kiev. Moscow, meanwhile, insists on the, on the withdrawal of heavy weapons and direct talks between Kiev and the regions of Donetsk and Lugansk. There have also been suggestions that the deal will feature a 50 to 70 kilometer demilitarized zone along the current line dividing anti-government troops and those loyal to Kiev. In preliminary reports say Kiev and the two self-proclaimed Eastern Republics have given guarantees to begin a ceasefire. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe will reportedly monitor the ceasefire in Ukraine and the withdrawal of heavy weapons. Now, just around the time that the uh, top-level talks in Ukraine were launching in Minsk, a hospital in the city of Donetsk came under shelling, which killed at least one person. Eight people, including some patients, were also injured as mortars rained down on a ward and a laboratory. That's just hours after another shelling, this of a bus, uh, a central station in the centre of the city, that left six people dead. A number of vehicles parked there were completely burnt out. And at least three mortars landed there early on Wednesday morning, just as people were heading to work. Now, the ongoing war in the east of Ukraine has been taking an increasing toll on civilians there. 
crippling lives and forcing thousands to flee their destroyed homes. Last week, we told the story of one such family from Donetsk who lost a child as he choked under the rubble of their home, which had been hit by shelling. The boy's mother couldn't save her son because she herself had lost a leg. Although nothing could replace that loss, there is still some relief for that family. Their second child, who was also injured, is now being evacuated to Moscow. There, the boy will now be able to undergo vital surgery. Самочувствие нормальное, настроение такое бодрое. Я рада, что вывозят ребенка, что его подлечат. Sorry for interrupting there, it's RT International. Back to our breaking news story as we continue here. Huge progress being reported in the peace talks in Minsk. It's where the leaders of Russia, Germany, France and Ukraine have been meeting for approximately 17 hours. The Russian President Vladimir Putin now addressing the media. This has not been the best night in my life. I think it is a good morning because in spite of all the difficulties we had in the talks, we still managed to agree on the main things. The reason why it took so long is that the Kyiv authorities, unfortunately, do not want to enter into direct contact with the Donetsk and Luhansk Republic representatives. And you know, you need to understand the reality. If you want to negotiate uh, for long-term contracts, you need to work in direct contact. But anyway, we had to deal with the circumstances we've had, and I think we've been able to reach a lot of things. The first thing is a ceasefire. Starting on the 15th of February at midnight. The next thing that I believe is very important is the withdrawal of heavy weapons for Ukrainian troops. As of today, the line that they have uh, as of today, the Ukrainian troops and the withdrawal of uh, Donbas militias from this line that was uh, pinpointed in the agreement we signed last year. Then there is also the political settlement. The first thing is a constitutional reform that should take into consideration the legitimate rights of people who live in Donbass. Next, what follows is border issues, which uh, should be coordinated with the Donbass militias, as well as humanitarian affairs and the implementation of the earlier adopted law on a special status of Donetsk and Lugansk. And finally, there is a whole range of economic and humanitarian issues. We hope that all the parties will exercise restraint before there is an entire total ceasefire. However, the original problem was that the representatives of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics maintain that as a response to the aggressive action by the Kyiv authorities, they did not only hold back their attacks, but they even launched an offensive and they encircled a group of six to eight thousand troops. They believe, they hope that those troops will lay down their arms and stop resistance. But yet we call on all the parties to exercise restraint, to prevent further bloodshed and do the utmost in order to make sure that the withdrawal of troops and heavy weapons goes well as planned.
Ukrainian authorities believe that there is no encirclement, that their troops are not encircled. They hope that things will go smoothly. Initially, I had my own doubts about this, and I'm willing to share them with you. Even if uh, those people are indeed encircled, those who are encircled, they're going to try to break through it, and those who are outside will do their best to try and make a corridor to cut through the encirclement. But I talked to Mr. Poroshenko, and we agreed that we are going to ask our military experts to find out what is really going on on the ground. And we hope we can work out some kind of measures to verify the implementation on both sides. Once again, I'd like to ask the conflicting parties to stop the bloodshed at the earliest possible date and launch a long-term political process. Thank you. All right, so there we are. After approximately 17 hours of a very stressful evening of talks, that was the Russian president there, Vladimir Putin, uh, admitting that this was the longest set of talks ever in his presidential career. The peace talks, of course, for eastern Ukraine occurring in Minsk. We can cross back to the Russian president now. His comments continue. Right now, and it was signed by the contact group. <laughs> It's called a document on measures to implement the Minsk agreements. And the second one is a statement by the presidents of France, Ukraine and me, and the Chancellor of Germany, Ms. Merkel, saying that we support this process. All right, uh, taking that, some final questions from the press. The Russian President Vladimir Putin, as I mentioned a moment ago, after approximately 17 hours of peace negotiations in Minsk at the Independence Palace, the leaders of France, Ukraine, uh, certainly uh, Russia was there as well, all trying to come, to come to a head and all get down to the right table and tick the right boxes here. Let's go over what the Russian President there said has been, for the most part, agreed upon after 17 hours of negotiations. Uh, one of the problems, uh, Mr. Putin saying, was that Kiev authorities do not want direct talks with representatives from Donetsk and Lugansk, of course, in battled regions in eastern Ukraine. Uh, Vladimir Putin saying that as of midnight on February the 15th, a ceasefire should and must come into effect. Also, Vladimir Putin saying they've agreed upon the hypothetical agreement, hopeful agreement, the withdrawal of heavy weapons from Ukraine's troops and that of Donbass militias withdrawing from the contested areas. Vladimir Putin saying that humanitarian assistance must be allowed. One of the sticking points amid these hours of negotiations here, that of granting a special status to the Donetsk and Lugansk regions. The Russian president uh, calling on all sides to clearly exercise restraint. Uh, Vladimir Putin going back to the original problem amid these negotiations that representatives from Donetsk and Lugansk were complaining about aggression from Kiev soldiers that were reportedly encircled in the Debaltsievo region just to the east of Ugolgorsk, another flashpoint there. Uh, Ukrainian authorities believe their troops are not encircled in Debaltsievo. The Russian president saying whether that is true or not, a corridor should appear, a peaceful exit of some means should be made possible. In fact, uh, the Russian president saying he had heard from rebel militias that they were upset from the aggressive stance of Kiev soldiers uh, encircled, hypothetically, in the Debaltsievo region. Uh, the final statement, though, from the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, calling on all sides to stop the bloodshed and allow the political process to be engaged by all of those in attendance. Now, the EU earlier announced new sanctions against Russian officials and militias in East Ukraine, but held off putting them in place to give peace talks a chance. 
I'm now joined by the president of the French-Russian Trade and Industry Chamber, Emmanuel Kide, to discuss uh, the effects of such a move uh, so far. Thank you very much for coming on. On such an important day for international news here, Emmanuel, uh, how hard has Russia been hit to this point by the international sanctions over the crisis in Ukraine? It has been uh, hard and it has been difficult uh, for Russia because at first, of course, the, the sanction didn't hit them, but with time it did. Actually, there is one sanction which is extremely important and it's the one re, uh, relating to the financing where Russian bank could not at first refinance themselves in US dollars for more than 90 days and now it's down to 30 days. And that's an asphyxia of the Russian economy and of course it has effect. Mm. Certainly, we understand the, the, the sheer importance of, of, uh, of the economic relationship between Europe and, of course, with Russia. Uh, you're sitting with me now here in the RT International Studios here in Moscow. You are watching Vladimir Putin's uh, statement just now. What did you make of what the Russian president had to say? Well, I'm very hopeful that uh, uh, this uh, treaty, I don't know if it's a peace treaty yet, but this treaty will uh, work. Uh, they are talking about a ceasefire, that the most important thing is right now, they are talking a ceasefire starting at uh, midnight to, today, and I certainly hope it's going to work. We need peace in Ukraine. Good for business, do you think? It's very good for business, it's very good for Russia, it's very good for Ukraine. It's what uh, right now we all need here. We understand that uh, you know, there's damage has been done to the European economy, damage has been done to the Russian economy also, albeit with the combination of, uh, of the oil prices as well. Uh, just last hour, I spoke with uh, Miloslav Ransdorf, a Czech MEP, and he was saying that ultimately, at the end of the day, um, European interests don't reflect that of some of its Western partners, uh, citing external influence or perhaps disturbance uh, with the relationship between Russia and Europe. Who stands to gain the most and who stands to lose the most when it comes to the economic sanctions? between Europe and Russia? Russia um, is being hit by the sanction from Europe, but also from the one uh, from the US. Uh, actually, uh, we have been saying for months uh, uh, that uh, we need to be very careful as European uh, uh, for uh, any sanction, because any economical sanction to Europe, uh, to Russia, will turn and will have a boomerang effect to uh, the EU economy. Uh, and it's exactly what happened. We could see that actually uh, um, trade between the EU and Russia went down by about 20 percent, uh, which eats Russia, but eats a lot of course the EU economy. Meanwhile, uh, um, the, the trade with the US has increased by 17 percent. If I can, Emmanuel, just jump in for a moment here. You're bringing up some very important facts and figures, but we're just showing, again, live pictures here of the Independence Palace in Minsk after approximately 17 hours of what were termed to be very nervous peace talks going on there uh, between the leaders of Russia, Ukraine, France and Germany. Uh, you could see uh, the, the leaders there as we're just losing a bit of the picture here. Uh, 17 plus hours of peace negotiations. The Russian president so far, the only one to come out and address the media, addressing the press, saying that he hopes that as of uh, midnight on February the 15th, a ceasefire will come into effect and that all parties will work to stop the bloodshed and a true political process will be the way forward. As I'm talking here with Emmanuel Kide, uh, it, it turns out uh, when it comes to the French-Russian trade and industry chamber that you are a part of, you understand the value, the, the, the billions if not trillions of euros that are exchanged on an annual basis between Russia and the EU. Now, with what's been happened with these peace talks in Minsk, what can you forecast as the next hopeful step? That peace will last. Uh, but if I may say something about François Hollande and Angela Merkel, I'm extremely glad and extremely actually proud that uh, both of them uh, came uh, to Minsk uh, to help on this uh, very important process, which I think could not have been concluded uh, without uh, both of them. So, if this is su successful, uh, we can uh, probably hope for uh, any EU sanction to be lifted uh, and of course Russian uh, sanction uh, to the EU being lifted and then uh, business starting again. And why is it important? We could say, well, uh, it's business, but why is it important? Because the more relationship we will have between Russia and the EU or the EU and Russia, the more it will help uh, in uh, modernizing uh, um, uh, Russia, first of all, and of course uh, uh, EU and uh, making peace with the EU. Now, we understand here, Emmanuel, as, as you and I are talking, it just came out about an hour or so ago that uh, tentatively the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has reached a staff level agreement with Ukraine on a four year program of a $17.5 billion loan. That'll trump up loans to $40 billion for Ukraine. Are you, as a businessman at heart, how do you view that? 
Well, I, Ukraine need the money anyway, so uh, without money they will not succeed. But I understand that this loan is uh, also linked to some very important reform that uh, Ukraine needs to do. And, uh, and there is a lot of reform which well, needs And when you to say begin. reform that Ukraine needs to do, you're, you're referring to that uh, of the RADA perhaps, uh, politicians perhaps? Or uh, where is the money going or where would it go? Uh, it, it's uh, probably economical uh, uh, reforms. Uh, uh, it will have a social impact. Uh, and, and uh, probably in some institutional reform also, but that's uh, another question. What do you think about the reaction of the stock markets today? And, and in effect, what do you think the ruble uh, might do, having lost so much of its power in recent months? I don't know. I never understand uh, what uh, currency does. So I don't know what the ruble will do. The, the, uh, the devaluation of the ruble uh, so far has been very much linked to the price of oil. Mm. Uh, so would uh, today has an impact on the ruble? Probably, but I think very limited. All right, Emmanuel Kide, the president of the French-Russian Trade and Industry Chamber. Uh, thanks for coming in here to RT International on such an important day. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and we will be back after a very short break. It's RT International, live from Moscow. It's RT International. Hello again. Uh, the U.S. President Barack Obama has taken the war with Islamic State to a new level after six months of airstrikes against the jihadists in Iraq and Syria. He's now asking Congress to allow him to use limited ground forces, even though just several months ago uh, this was his uh, front line. As your Commander-in-Chief, I will not commit you and the rest of our armed forces to fighting another ground war in Iraq. Well, let's uh, take a look to see uh, what the U.S. leader wants to do now. Uh, the request would allow Barack Obama to deploy U.S. forces whenever he deems it appropriate. It would limit military operations to three years. However, the administration would be free to expand the war to other countries. And if Obama's demands are met, it will be the first time Congress has approved the use of ground forces since 2002, when George W. Bush pushed for the invasion of Iraq. More now with RT correspondent Amira David. The president still maintains that he will not implement any large-scale ground combat operation. The resolution we've submitted today does not call for the deployment of U.S. ground combat forces to Iraq or Syria. It is not the authorization of another ground war like Afghanistan or Iraq. Let's be clear that he will authorize ground troops, but he's saying he will do so in specific instances. He's calling these limited circumstances, and those circumstances include rescue operations involving U.S. and coalition personnel, special operations against Islamic State leadership, also intelligence collection and sharing, which the administration says it absolutely cannot do without having eyes and ears on the ground and having actual uh, people on the ground to do it for them. Let's also be clear that we do not know at this point exactly how many troops the president wants to authorize to go into Iraq uh, and possibly into Syria. We know that we already have uh, more uh, than uh, a couple of thousand there right now. And the question is, does he want to put hundreds in? Does he want to put thousands in? Is there a finite number uh, of troops he expects to see, or is it unlimited? Yeah, Republicans say Obama's plan is half-baked. They want stronger measures against the militants, while the Democrats want stricter limits on the use of troops. And we talked to two experts who believe the draft will actually allow Washington to wage war in the Middle East for ultimately as long as it wants. This notion that somehow there's not going to be a ground war is belied by this authorization itself. In this authorization, it says that there will now be, there will be no enduring ground troops meaning that there will be no permanent ground troops. So the president can put as many troops into Iraq, into Syria, into any other place where he deems the Islamic State is operating, with the caveat that they are only there temporarily, they're not there permanently. So it really is just semantics meant to hide the fact that the United States is going to find itself again in the middle of Middle Eastern civil wars. It's very dangerous, as I say, open-ended, vague, amorphous, authorization giving the military enormous power to widen the wars that already are going on, which mean troops, they say not troops on the ground, but they're already troops on the ground and that will increase. And it is a very great danger to Iraq and to Syria, where still the agenda, the U.S. agenda, is for regime change, is for the destruction 
of the sovereign government. It's RT International. Let's give you a reminder now of our breaking news story. The leaders of Russia, Germany, France and Ukraine have agreed on a ceasefire for eastern Ukraine after easily more than 16 hours of marathon talks in Minsk. Let's show you the two main points of the deal announced by President Putin, well, just moments ago to the press. Starting from midnight February the 15th, the truce will take effect in the region, which has been plagued by months of bloodshed. Kiev's army and local militia forces will withdraw heavy armor from the front line. The delegations are leaving right now after managing to agree on the main and most important points. Let's show you live pictures right now. Uh, hard to make them out, but you can see Francois Hollande is just in the middle of that right there. He's actually looking on very good form, apart from being up for hours on end. Angela Merkel from Germany was ultimately the first to run away. She dashed out the main door, looking pretty worse for wear. Uh, the Russian president, we, as far as we could tell, was the only leader there to come and address the press. And you can see what a press junket it has been indeed, uh, with them trying to sleep on the sofas, even on the floors of the Independence Palace, after approximately 17 hours of peace talks. Now, the Russian, German, French and Ukrainian leaders haven't signed any mutual declaration about the implementation of this revamped Minsk, Minsk deal. However, uh, there we have uh, uh, Poroshenko there and uh, Lukashenko, Alexander, the uh, Belarusian president, them uh, seemingly going to be the last two to stay. And boy, oh boy, what an exciting 17 hours it has been here on RT International. Putin saying that sides have agreed to withdraw heavy artillery from the front line. Up next here on RT International, how mass surveillance of U.S. citizens is expanding day by day, despite the efforts of whistleblowers.